because I will be talking about the two data structures that show up in programming interviews the most. And those are linked lists and hash tables. I was delaying a bit to hopefully give a chance for everyone to get here, but it looks like most people are here now. Um, so this will come in the format of two separate lectures. In the middle, we'll take a break. I uh, don't want to overload you with too much information too fast if this is a new concept for you. Um, although, for some of you, it may not be. So, linked lists and hash tables. Data structures to make life betterer. Just says that there. I don't know why. So, in general, when working with data structures in any sort of programming thing, you're going to have to choose the right tool for the job. And different data structures come with many different trade-offs. And so the one you choose will depend usually entirely on the data that you're trying to store with it and the access patterns, like how you need to access that data. So for example, hash tables are unsorted. Linked lists are sorted. So sometimes you want your data to be sorted um, so that you can access it quickly if you need to access a certain kind of thing, maybe that's at the beginning. or. Maybe you need constant time access, so maybe you need to be able to access every element very quickly, independently, and it doesn't matter that it's sorted. So in general, it's really important to learn about all these data structures so that you can choose the right one for what you're trying to accomplish. So it's all about the context, what is the shape of the data, what are the constraints on it, and which operations need to be fast. So when we talk about which operations need to be fast, we normally call that a complexity analysis. And that's what Alan introduced yesterday with the big O notation. So whenever we analyze how fast an operation is on a data structure, we'll do it using you know, the big O of n, big O of 1, big O n squared, those sorts of uh, operators to give us an easy and fast idea about how quick the access is. So, Let's talk about linked lists. These are sort of one of the most fundamental data structures in computer science. So before we talk about linked lists, though, we have to talk about arrays. So the list you use in Python is named a list, but it's actually implemented as an array. So when we talk about arrays, we're talking about a very similar thing to the lists that you've been using in Python. Arrays are allocated as a contiguous piece of memory. So that's like kind of really important. That means when you store things in an array or in the list in Python, if you were to open up the RAM and look at the actual cells in memory, you would see that all the data is stored sequentially in sort of sequential addresses. Um, that gives us some very important properties, um, which we'll talk about in just a second. You also need to know that with arrays, you can only store the same size data at each index. Um, and there's a very good reason for that. But that means if you're using an array, uh, especially in like a C style language, like C or C++, you actually have to tell the data structure what you're going to be storing in the array before you start storing things. And you can only store one kind of thing in it. So for example, if I had an array of integers, then the compiler would look at the size of the integer and know that each space it allocates for every element has to be the size of an integer. So then how do lists in Python work, right? We can add anything to a list in Python. Well, there's actually an extra level of indirection. So in Python, it's an array of pointers. And those pointers point to the data, actually sort of in a similar way to how linked lists work. So a, the list in Python is kind of like a hybrid between an array and a linked list that kind of gives you two advantages, but we'll talk about more about that in a bit. So there's two kinds of arrays. There's static arrays, which means memory is allocated once and the size can't change. So in a C kind, like a C type language, I can allocate an array of integers and I can tell it I want to be able to store 10 integers in that array. That means I can only ever store 10 elements. I will only be able to access indexes, indices 0 through 9. So that means if I want to add more than 10 elements, I'm out of luck. I can replace the ones that are in there. I can access them. 
but I can't add any more. Those are static arrays. There's also dynamic arrays. So dynamic arrays allocate a chunk of memory, and then once you fill that complete chunk of memory, it will say, OK, it looks like you filled the whole thing. And if you try and add another element, it will actually allocate a much larger piece of memory, copy everything over from the old array into the new location of memory that has blank space at the end, and then it will let you add additional elements. So lists in Python are actually dynamic arrays. So it starts out, yes, Mike? So in general, whenever you can tell the compiler how much memory you're going to be need ahead of time, it can do a lot of optimizations with that. It knows you'll never need to grow the memory. So it can allocate you a chunk of memory. And then it can allocate stuff right after it. And it doesn't have to worry about it. Um, and it can also allocate all the memory you need immediately. So in most dynamic arrays, if you don't tell it how much memory you want right away, it'll give you something like maybe 8 or like 16 spaces. But if you want to add thousands of items, it'll go from like 8 to 16. Maybe it'll double every time, 64, 128. So you end up reallocating your array maybe 10, 12 times to add 1,000 items, which is obviously very slow. So in general, when you can tell uh, the compiler how much space you need ahead of time, if you know already your storage requirements, that will help it out because it will only have to allocate the memory once. Um, so lists in Python are dynamic arrays of pointers to elements. So we'll talk a bit more about pointers in a second. But this is what an array looks like in any sort of C-like language. So it's a contiguous piece of memory. They're sort of each cell of memory is represented as a square here. And they have indexes. So if you want to access the first element, most languages are zero indexed, so you can access it here. So if we know that the address of A0, so we know that this address here is some address like 2000. So when you look at addresses in your computer, you'll see them very commonly. Like, for example, if you do a print on like a class that you haven't overrode the two string method, like the string method, then it won't know how you want to print it out. So instead, it, it will just print what it knows. So any kind of class you create in Python, like a custom class, if you try to print it, it'll just print out the address that that instance lives in memory. So normally, you'll see it as like a hexadecimal thing, like 0x, a, b, 3, 7, 2, 6, 5, d, f. Like, addresses in memory are normally hexadecimal strings. They're very long. And they're usually not entirely useful for you, although you can use them to compare to see if two pointers are pointing at the exact same thing. Because if two pointers have the same memory address, then they both represent the exact same thing. But anyway, let's say element 0 here is at memory address 2000. And let's say we have six memory units allocated for each item in the array. Maybe this is like six bits, for example. So what is the equation to find the memory address for index 4? Does anybody have an idea? How would we find what the memory address is at index 4? We can figure it out based on the information we have here. We know the size of each element. We know the starting address at A0. And we know that index 4 is that many elements from the starting address. So what would the equation be? Yes, Ignat. A0 plus 4 times 6. A0 plus 4 times 6. That sounds good to me. So that would get you the actual address here. So in general, it looks like this. The address of any index i in the array can be calculated by the address of index 0 plus the size of each element times the index that you're looking for. So this is the general case. So like Ignaz said, if we want to calculate the address at index 4, it's 2,000 plus 4 times 6. So it's 2,024 is the address of that element. So that's interesting. We can calculate the address of the array right away, which has like a really important 
consequence for us as developers. Does anyone know why this is very important that we can do this? Mike? Yes, so S is the size. Actually, those should be swapped, though. So okay. that's a good point. I will remember to fix that. So yeah, the size is 6. Index is 4. Those should be swapped. Yes, Ignat. Yeah, so that's a good point. That's, that may or may not be the reason everything is 0 indexed. Um, probably actually it isn't, but it does make this equation simpler, right? So you can just multiply instead of having to add an extra, like, say it's an operator. Maybe it is the reason. Because every time you access memory, if you had to do an extra operation, like an extra addition, that's like a lot of extra operators. So that's a good point. So anyway, why is it super important that this equation exists? Why is it super important for arrays that we can calculate the address and memory that we want to access? Yes? Right. So Kevin said we can access that value immediately. That means in arrays, when we want to access a certain element by its index, it's constant time access. It doesn't matter how big the array is, we can index at any point in the array and grab the item immediately without having, for example, to search through the array, which is super important. So if we have an, an array that's a million elements long and we want to access the last element, we don't have to search through a million elements. We can just jump to the exact, exact address in memory that the element we're looking for is located at. So we get that property because arrays are contiguous pieces of memory and because the size is known beforehand of each element. So if you have elements of varying size, <clears throat> excuse me, varying size, you cannot do this. You can't just jump immediately and grab the correct address unless you do it like how Python has it implemented, where every element is not where the data is stored. Every element is a pointer to some other location in memory where the actual data is stored. So in Python, when you access the element at index 4, it goes to index 4, and it finds here an address to another piece of memory, then it jumps to that piece of memory, and then it knows that the element lives there. Yes, Colin. Is it efficient to have the extra level of indirection, the jump? So the answer is no. It's slightly less efficient than, uh, for example, a C-level language where you would store the data directly in the element. Because there is that extra instruction, it has to execute an extra level of indirection. But overall, Python is an interpreted language. It's not intended to be blazingly fast. It's just intended to be quick and easy to use. And that's sort of like a big trade-off in general in programming languages when choosing the right tool for the job. If everything was written in C or C++, everything might be faster, but there also might be more bugs because it's lower level. And it also takes longer to write C or C++ code, even for an expert than an expert level Python programmer to write the equivalent code in most cases. So there's all these trade-offs in computer science. And choosing the language is the same as choosing the data structure. You have the you have to choose the right tool for the job. And maybe it's much more important that you're able to get the software finished quickly and that when you run into performance problems, you can scale it by buying more hardware, buying more computers. Um, whereas if, for example, you're writing the Linux kernel, you want that to be as efficient as possible because that's getting deployed millions of places and is basically powering everything ever. So in that case, you want to write it in C so that everything is like as fast as possible. So arrays are very powerful because you can access any element instantly in constant time. So let's talk about what is the runtime for a dynamic array. So this is like the big O stuff that we were just talking about. So some of you will already know these answers and be familiar. Some of you may not. Don't shout out the answer right away if you know it. Give people a second to think about it, and then we'll talk about it. So we're going to have a table here of an operation in a dynamic array, and then the worst case scenario for runtime for that operation. So this says access element via index. By the way, all these slides are up on your dashboard now, so if you're having trouble reading it, you can just download them and follow along. 
So what is the worst case runtime to access an element via its index in a dynamic array? Anyone? Isabella? O of one, right. O of one, that means constant time. That means the time to access an individual element is not dependent on the length of the array. It means it's the same amount of instructions no matter what the length of the array is. So this right here is one of the most powerful sort of element, uh, aspects of an array. The fact that it's sorted and the fact that you can access things in constant time. For unsorted constant time access, you can use a dictionary in Python, which is just an implementation of a hash table. So we'll talk about hash tables very soon when we're done with linked lists. But these are both very elemental data structures because they offer constant time access. With arrays, you get sorted constant time access. With hash tables, you get unsorted constant time access. OK. So how about what is the runtime to insert or delete an element at the beginning or in the middle of an array? So if we insert an element at the beginning of this array, to maintain the sorting order, that means we have to move every single element after it. So we would have to grab element 0, stick it in the spot of element of index 1, grab 1, stick it in 2. We would have to move the whole thing to add something to a beginning of an array. So what is the runtime to insert or delete an element at the beginning or in the middle of a dynamic array? Yeah, David. Big O of n, right. Why is it big O of n? Exactly. Did everyone hear that? In the worst case, you have to move every single element, which is there's n elements, so that's like everything. So this is one of the bad things about arrays. We get this constant time access, which is great, but if we want to insert, delete anything at the beginning or the middle, which is, the middle means basically anything that's not the very, very end, then suddenly we can only do it in end time, which is very slow. Especially considering when you might have to reallocate memory. But n is not ideal when you have 10 billion items in your array, right? OK. What about if we want to insert or delete an element at the end? So this is a dynamic array. So remember, that means when it allocates the memory, it allocates extra space at the end that's empty so that you can add things. And then once you fill up that extra space, it has to reallocate a whole new chunk of memory, copy everything over, and then hopefully you have extra space at the end. But what does that mean for inserting or deleting an element at the very end of the array? What's the runtime complexity for that? Ideally, because this is a dy dynamic array, that means there's all this extra allocated memory that's empty on the end, which means we can just slot the element right at the end. So we can do it in constant time. Yeah, Mike. Let's say slapping at the end fills it up. Are you not counting the allocating extra space and slapping it over, as you said, that is not counting towards the cost here? Right. It isn't counted towards the cost, but in many cases, that will actually happen. So this is uh, here, you will find that big O notation can be kind of fuzzy because there's many different ways to implement these data structures. And so you can always tweak them to try and get better or worse performance. But the ideal dynamic array kind of assumes that you have the extra space on the end already. But that's a very good point. OK. So now that we talked about arrays, now let's talk about linked lists. So linked lists are not a contiguous piece of memory. So they're not like arrays. Linked lists allow you to store different size items at each index. So that's why um, linked lists, that's one reason they're very powerful. With an array, a static or dynamic one, the size of everything you insert has to be the exact same. So generally, that means you have to insert the same kind of thing, like an integer or a floating point value or something like that. Whereas with linked lists, you can add anything in there. You can add integers, strings of whatever length. You can add classes, instances of classes that you've made. You can add tuples. Doesn't matter. So linked lists are dynamic. Every time you add a new element, 
a small piece of memory is allocated. So it's not like it's allocating a huge chunk of memory and copying everything, which is slow. It's just allocating a tiny chunk of memory that's big enough for the thing you're trying to store every time you add something to a linked list. So because of that and because of the structure, which we will see in the next slide, there's no need to copy the whole thing like an array. So you're never running out of space as long as you have free memory in your computer. You're just allocating tiny chunks of extra space every time you add something. So this is sort of the fundamental structure of a linked list, like the smallest element, which is called a node. So a node in a linked list is actually just two pointers in the simplest case. It's a pointer to the next node, and it's a pointer to the data. So when you store something in a linked list, the data does not go in the memory location. Instead, it stores an address to where the data resides. So that, this is why lists in Python are kind of hybrids of arrays and linked lists. They're contiguous piece of memory, like arrays, but instead of storing the data at the memory location, they store a pointer to some other memory location where the actual data is stored. So let's see what this looks like. Here is sort of you know, the visual description of a linked list. It's composed of nodes, one node for every element. There is one pointer that points to the first node. You need that because you need to be able to access the linked list. Without this pointer, this would all live in memory, but you would never be able to access it because you wouldn't know where it is in memory. And every node has a data pointer that points to a chunk of data that can be any size. So we see here all the data is different sizes, but it's OK because these nodes point to it. By the way, these nodes are not in contiguous memory. That's why they have pointers to them. So the arrays didn't need pointers because we could calculate where each element was based on the address and the index and the size. Linked lists are not like that. This points to some random location in memory, which points to some other random location in memory. Is that clear? Any questions about this structure of a linked list? So linked lists are very common in programming interviews. You will very often see a question like, given a linked list like this, how would you write the code that would delete an element in the middle of the list? Or given a linked list, how would you reverse the order of every single element in the linked list. So very commonly, that means writing for loops or while loops, iterating through the linked list, and then finding the element in question, if you're trying to delete one, and then reassigning these pointers so that they no longer. So if we wanted to delete this yellow data one, we would have to find the node before it. We would have to move this pointer so that it skips over this one, so that it's no longer part of the linked list. So that's why we're going to actually have you implement your own linked lists uh, as part of the milestone that's actually hopefully finished today, although if you can't finish it today, that's OK. But in part six of the tutorial, you're going to end up implementing your own hash table. And as part of that, you'll implement a linked list also. And we'll see why when we get to the hash tables lecture. All right, so now let's talk about the runtime the runtime complexity of doing various operations on a linked list. So if we know the index of an element, if we know it's like the fifth node in the linked list, what is the runtime complexity? How, in big O notation, how much time will it take in the worst case to access, for example, the fifth element or any element? The fifth element is a good movie starring Bruce Willis, by the way. How long will it take to access an element in the linked list? Yeah, Isabel. Exactly. She said it will be big O of n because you need to basically access all the previous nodes in order to get to the element in question. So you start at the head node, and then you iterate through until you find the node that you're looking for, so you can either access it or delete it. Yes, Ignat. Yeah, so isn't the size of the pointer in a linked list the same? 
So for example, doesn't that mean we could store this in a contiguous piece of memory and get faster indexing? The answer is, in most cases, yes, which is why Python actually does like a linked list array hybrid. It does that for the list data structure. Um, but this is sort of the computer science abstract sense linked list in which you can't just jump to the element. Because the people that invented it didn't really sort of theorize it that way. Yes. Also, that's another reason. The way linked lists work is it doesn't allocate the memory at the beginning. It just allocates one tiny chunk for every item you add and for the data. But it allocates them in random places in memory. So you have to follow the pointers to jump all these different places in memory. You can't just index in. Unless you do a thing like Python and you have an array linked list hybrid. OK. So how about what is the runtime to insert or delete an element at the very beginning of the linked list? Any ideas? Yeah, David? It'd be constant time. Why would it be constant? Exactly. We have the head pointer to the first element. So all we have to do is allocate a new space randomly in somewhere in memory and then reassign this head pointer to point to that element. And then that element should point to the previous head, head element. So this is another big advantage of linked lists over arrays is that inserting an item at the beginning is not an n runtime complexity sort of proposition. It's actually just constant time. So actually, if you read the documentation on Python lists, because it's a hybrid, it says you probably shouldn't be adding a bunch of items to the beginning of a Python list because it's going to be really inefficient and it's going to take like n time instead of constant time. So there's actually a special data structure in Python that lets you add elements at the beginning or the beginning or the end of an uh, of the data structure. It's called a DEC, but it's spelled like D-Q, D-E-Q-U-E. -E. Um, that data structure will give you constant time access at the beginning, at the end. So that's a special thing. It's pronounced DEC, actually, but it is like a D-Q. That's how it's spelled. Personally, I prefer saying D-Q also, but who am I to decide that? I just cheated a little bit. All right, so finally, if we want to insert or delete an element in the middle of the linked list, what is the runtime? Yeah, Nick? O of n. Why is it O of n? Exactly. We can't index into it. To get to some random element in the middle, we have to iterate through until we find it, starting at the head element. OK. Finally, what if we want to insert or delete an element at the end of the linked list? Yeah. O of n. Exactly. Why is it O of n? Yeah. The same reason as the middle. We have to go through the whole thing to find the space where the last node is, create a new node, Assign this pointer to point to that new last node. Yeah, Kelsey. Or sorry, Kevin. So why don't we just create a tail pointer? That's a good question. Usually you do create a tail pointer, actually. So then you can just access the last element directly and get constant time access. In this case, though, there is no tail pointer. Uh, we will see when we talk about doubly linked lists in just a second that those usually do have a tail pointer. But there's no reason you couldn't add one to a singly linked list, and most implementations will have them. Yeah, Ignat. Is there a way to iterate backwards? Is there a way to iterate backwards? In this data structure, no. You can't do it. But in a doubly linked list, yes. So doubly linked lists are the same thing, but every node has a pointer to the next element and a pointer to the previous element. So we also have a tail pointer so that we can access the final element and go backwards, or we can access the head element and go forwards. So doubly linked lists 
have some great performance improvements depending on what you're trying to do. But of course, for every node, you have to allocate another basically word of memory for the pointer. So every node has three pointers, one forward, one backward, and one to the data. So let's talk about the runtime complexity of a doubly linked list. So how long does it take to access an element via its index in the linked list? OK, Isabella has a question about this. Yeah? There is a difference. Um, so when I say insert here, this is where it gets a bit fuzzy and the language isn't clear. There's actually two operations happening at the insert. It's the find, like finding the yeah. index, like the node where you want to insert the item, and it's doing the insert. So these here include the find operation. And the find operation is always going to be big O of n. If we don't include the find operation, then all of these inserts or deletes will actually be constant time because it's just doing a couple pointer reassignments. Okay. But usually when people say insert, do they mean uh, both finding and? Generally speaking, when people say insert, they mean both finding and actually inserting the element. Yeah. So that was a good clarification question. So now, doubly linked list. How long does it take to access an element via its index? Yeah, Ignat. O of n. O of n. Why is it O of n? Well, it's uh, Yep. It's the same as a singly linked list. We still have to iterate through to find the element. Maybe we can save some time if we know that the element we're trying to access is very close to the end. Instead, maybe we can have this optimization where we start at the end and, and iterate backwards. But it's still going to be O of n, worst case complexity. All right, how about inserting, inserting or deleting an element at the beginning of the doubly linked list? O of 1. Yeah. It's O of 1, again, just like the singly linked list, because we have a pointer to the head element, so we can just reassign that pointer to a new node and have a new beginning element. How about inserting or deleting an element in the middle of the doubly linked list? By the way, this might seem a little tedious to go through every single one of these, but for programming interviews, you will have, need to have all of these memorized for every common data structure. It sounds a little difficult. It's not actually that difficult. There's a great website called Big O Cheat Sheet. That is basically a Big O Cheat Sheet for every data structure. It's in the additional resources section of your dashboard, or you can just Google Big O Cheat Sheet. So more important is that you understand how each of these work so that even if you don't have the time complexity of each of these memorized, you can just think about it and realize what it is because you understand the internal structure of all of these data structures, which is why you will be implementing these data structures as part of the Twitterbot uh, tutorial. So inserting or deleting in the middle. Exactly. So it is O of n. It would never take more than half of n. It's O of n because if it's n divided by 2, for example, we get rid of that element. We get rid of basically the largest factor always overrides any other part of the equation for the actual runtime. So that's what it is. So it would actually be n over 2, but the 2 is not important when you have 10 billion elements, kind of. All right, so inserting or deleting at the end. So this is where it changes from the singly linked list. Any ideas? Ignat? O of 1? Because we have a pointer to the end. Exactly. OK. So a linked list is like a freight train. It's a bunch of carriages connected together, and they can be different sizes, and they can have different stuff in them. So like you can have a freight train that's got a bunch of coal cars, but then it's got some like shipping cars with containers from giant shipping boats that just landed and were put on a train to ship across to middle America. Any questions about linked lists? That's a great question. I should have mentioned this, and it's awesome that you brought it up. Does the last element have a pointer to nothing? This element here, is that pointing to nothing? And the answer is yes. These pointers have to have the value none so that when you're iterating through, you know when you reach the end of the linked list. So when you're iterating a linked list, the way you usually would do it is you would assign node to head, and then you say while head, or sorry, while node is not none, and then you would 
Just check the data, see if, what's you want, if it's what you want. If it's not, you follow the next pointer, so you reassign node is equal to node.next, and you know you've reached the end when node is equal to none, when it's not pointing to anything. So that's actually how you know that you're at the end of a linked list is when the next pointer points to nothing. Otherwise, you really wouldn't have any idea. Yeah? So what, about, um, so what about iterating backwards? Same thing. If you start at the end and you keep on going, once you get the previous uh, pointer is none, then you know you've reached the first element of the list. Although you could just actually compare the value of node to the head value, the head pointer, and if they're pointing at the same element, then you also know that you've reached the first element. Yeah, Ignat. Okay, this is a great question. So what is the runtime complexity of querying the length of the list? If we want to know how many elements are stored, what is the runtime complexity of that based on this data structure? Yeah. Big O of n. So it's n because we have to go through every element and count it to see how many are in there. Yes. Right, couldn't we just keep a variable in the class that keeps track of what the length is, and we increment it every time we add an element, we decrement it every time we delete one? The answer is yes, and pretty much every implementation ever will actually do that. It's a great idea, so that way you can query the length of the list in constant time. Um, so that's a great optimization, yes. Is the access time of every pointer the same? As in, like, following each pointer to a random location in memory? Yeah. Theoretically, the answer is yes. Truthfully, the answer is no, because there's these things called caches that live in your processor. Uh, the short story about caches is that every time you access, like, you load a chunk of data from memory, it doesn't just load the tiny little chunk you're looking for. It loads, like, eight, for example, recent processors have an eight megabyte L3 cache which means every time you access a piece of memory, it actually loads eight megabytes of that memory at one time into the cache of the processor, and it's way faster to access things out of the cache of the processor than out of memory. It's like an order of magnitude faster. It's like 10 times faster. So that means if you're using a data structure like an array where everything is in a contiguous piece of memory, that means it's even faster to access the element because most of the time it will be grabbing the data out of the cache and not out of actual RAM on your computer. So theoretically, the answer is no. It takes the same amount of time to access every pointer. Practically, the answer is actually yes, it's different because of cache effects. So caches became a really big thing maybe in the last 15 years or so. They got bigger and bigger to the point where now it makes sense to optimize your data structure for caching behavior because that will, for all intents and purposes, actually speed up your program the most. So you can bet your bottom dollar that the Googles and the Facebooks have their own custom data structures that are designed to work very well with caches and processors. Okay, so that's it for linked list. We will take a five minute break now